so awesome. I'm so grateful that he stepped in. But, but like I said, Reba and I weren't here last week, but we were planning on having Kevin preach. Uh, he was already scheduled to step in, and he did a great job kicking off our series, Be Thou My Vision. But last week, Reba and I were celebrating Christmas in Wisconsin, and we were going to drive back on Saturday. And then Minnesota decided to freeze over uh, on Saturday. So we were stuck in Wisconsin, and we couldn't make it here. We were going to lead worship. And last week, you know, one thing I love, one thing I think really shows signs of a healthy church is when one person goes down, another person is ready to step up. And last week we had Joe Shonak step in last minute and lead worship for us. Church, would you just thank him with me for stepping in, using his gifts and his talents to glorify God and to serve the church. And I'm so thankful for that. Uh, this morning we had more people down. My wife Reba isn't feeling very good. She's our worship leader and she's sick right over here. And we had vocalists that we texted last night at 1030 saying, hey, would you step in? And they said, you betcha, was literally the text message, you betcha. Isn't that incredible that we have people just ready at any moment's notice? Can we thank all of our volunteers that are here this morning serving on the worship team back in kids? Honestly, what we accomplish as a church has very little to do with what I can do. And it has everything to do what God can do through all of us when we come together. Amen. I'm so thankful that we have a church of people willing to just say yes to what God could do through them. So anyways, I just have to celebrate you guys because you're incredible. Everybody look at your neighbor and say you're incredible. So we're in the second week of our series called Be Thou My Vision. Everybody look at your neighbor and say Be Thou My Vision. And so in this series, we're discovering God's vision for me, mine, and ours. We're discovering what, what God's vision, what his plan, what his desires are for our lives. And last week, Pastor Kevin laid the foundation. If you missed that message, go to our website, reachchurchmn.com. Click on watch, uh, and it'll bring you to our YouTube page. Uh, anytime you miss a message, you can go right there and see it. But he laid the foundation that really, we need to trust God with our vision and not compare our vision to someone else's. And that's going to be really important because today, in week two, we're going to discover God's vision for me. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, me. me. Now look at your second favorite neighbor and say, not you, me. me. Okay, we're discovering God's vision for me. We're discovering God's vision for you personally. And this is so exciting to me because usually when churches do vision series, it's just all about the church and about, about where God is bringing us. And the reason for that is because vision is so important. Vision is absolutely critical to success in any area of our life. But as your pastor, I don't want just success in our church. I want success in your life. I believe that we are the body of Christ. And that means that how every one of us are doing is how we are doing. That every one of us are a part of what God is wanting to do here through Reach Church in Alexandria, Minnesota, and around the world through missions. And so, the first week of this series where we're going through me, mine, and ours, I want to just focus on you. I want to help you discover God's vision for your life. So first, we need to clarify what we mean when we say God's vision. We're talking about discovering God's vision for me, for you. So what do I mean by that? Well, first off, I looked up vision in the dictionary, okay? And in this series, we're not talking about physical vision, okay? Like, we're not going to pull out the machine and go to the eye doctor and test to see if you're 2020 or not. Yeah, I was just there this week getting checked for contacts, uh, and we're not going to do that, okay? Because I don't know about any of you, but I swear, there are going to be those machines that shine the light and spray the air uh, where there is no eternal dwelling place with the Lord. Okay, I'm just saying. Those things are vicious. We're not going to do that. We're not talking about just the, the physical ability to see. We're talking about vision in terms of like you would reference it in regards to a business. Okay, so some of the definitions, don't put ours up there yet, but some of them were a mental image of something that could be in the future based on goals or aspirations was one definition. The next one, a mental image that is not yet real, but hoped for. So this, this vision is something that isn't real yet, but it's something that, that we hope is real, that we believe is going to be real in the future. It's an imagined idea or a goal toward which one aspires, an image or an insight of how something could be or should be. 
So your vision is, is what could your life be? What should your life be? Or an aspirational description of what you would like to achieve or accomplish in the long-term future. So I put all those together into our running definition for the series, trying to summarize all that. Vision means an aspirational glimpse, a mental image of what something could be in the future. As we look today, what is God's vision for me? What is God's vision for you? That's what we're going to try to figure out today. What is that aspirational, meaning that, that positive, that, that hopeful? What, what is the ideal condition in a glimpse, okay? It's not the whole picture. God isn't going to reveal to us exactly what our life is going to be like from here until the end of our life. Because that's not how God works. Because if we had that, we would have no need for faith. See, faith is the desire, the expectation of things that are hoped for. It's believing that good things are in the future. It's the longing for that. See, it's, and, and importantly, it's, it's not real yet. It's in the future. It's what something could be. It's what we hope for. It's our dreams. It's this this. This positive outlook, this, this little glimpse, and really in this series, what I'm praying for is that our prayers would be, God, would you just give me a glimpse? God, would you just help me form a, a quick mental image? I don't need all the detail. I don't need to know how I'm going to get there. But would you please just give me just a bit of vision for where you're bringing me, for where you are taking me, more importantly, for who you are making me to be. So we want to get this aspirational glimpse, mental image of what something could be in the future. And the Bible talks about vision a lot. The Bible actually says that it's very important. So my theme verse for this series is Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. And in multiple translations, it says all these things. So we're going to read a few of them. And then again, because uh, I was a Bible study major, okay? So there's sometimes that the translations, they're not inaccurate, but I feel like really to get the whole depth and meaning, you have to study it a little bit. So you're going to get a little bit of biblical scholarship here and see really what goes into translating words and how it all looks, okay? So Proverbs 29, 18, in a few different versions, says this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom and instruction. The important words there are revelation and cast off restraint. That's how the NAMB translated it. NASB, this is the most literal version translation you can get. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. KJV, okay, all you old school Christians right here. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It's saying where there isn't vision, people perish. Other translations said they cast off restraint. Those things are synonymous because what it's implying is that whenever someone casts off restraint, they're living carelessly, they're living dangerously, meaning they're going to enter their lives into danger and they're going to receive damage or destruction. It's really what the whole essence of that word means. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. ESV, my favorite translation, says, where there is no prophetic vision, see here it adds the word prophetic in there, people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. So here is my little take at this translation. Where there is no prophetic vision, people perish. Where there's no prophetic vision. And I put the word prophetic in there from the ESV because really what it's talking about here is in the Old Testament, Moses gave the law, meaning he gave God's instruction to his people for them to follow. And what is being said here in Proverbs is that when there is not a prophet, meaning a man of God who is helping declare the law, when there's not a, a prophet speaking on behalf of God, pointing people back to the law that God has already declared, when there, where there's no prophetic vision, there's no godly direction in someone's life, People perish, meaning they live however they want. They cast off restraint. They throw off everything that would hold them back, everything that would try to help them and control them in life. And ultimately, when they do that, they perish. They experience destruction. 
And see, this is so critical because what scripture is saying here is that where we do not have vision, things naturally decline, decay, and die. When we do not have prophetic vision in our life, meaning when we hear from God, okay, that doesn't mean that I'm the prophet and I hear from God for our church. That's not how God works anymore. Jesus came and said, hey, I'm going to go to heaven, but it's going to be better for you because I'm going to leave a what for you? A helper, the Holy Spirit. And he says that he's going to give his Holy Spirit to everyone. Meaning now, I am not the prophet for a massive group of people. I'm not the only one in this building right now that hears from God. Every one of us have the ability to hear from God because the Holy Spirit is in every single person who believes. And God wants to speak to you, He wants to speak to me. And so what scripture says is where there's no prophetic vision, the people perish. And so what that's telling us is that in our lives, if we do not have vision, we are going to cast off restraint And we are going to find those areas of our lives in decline, in decay, or even experiencing death. And so then my question for all of us is do do you, do I, do we have a vision for our lives? Literally, really practically speaking, do you right now have, have a vision statement from God for your life? Because what I believe is that if you don't, you are missing out on some of what God wants for you. Because if we do not have God's vision for our lives, we have areas of our life that are in decline, in decay, or in death. And that's why I'm so excited about this series, because really what I want to do, what we're going to do in these next three weeks is literally, you are going to write a vision statement for you. I'm writing one for me. Next week, we are going to write a vision statement for what is mine. You're going to write one for what is yours. What you're over, your family, your business, your coworkers, your environment, your friend group. You're going to write a vision statement over that area of your life. And lastly, what's ours? We are going to write a vision statement for what our place in the kingdom is like. Because if we don't have vision. We're not going to receive all that God has for us. Where there is no prophetic vision, where we do not have guidance from God, we cast off restraint. Literally, we literally, if we don't have vision for our lives, we're not working towards anything. We just kind of go through life and go through the motions. See, and, and the secular world knows that vision is so important because every good business out there has a vision statement. Just that that summary, that one sentence description of, of that aspirational glimpse, that mental image of what something could be in the future. And see, I want you to experience all that God has for you. And so today I want to help guide us through writing a vision statement for you. I want you to experience all that God has for you. I want you to have that vision, that little glimpse, that little picture of what your life looks like in following Christ Jesus. Because what we need to know is that God has a vision for our lives and he wants us to know it. As we just wrap up, okay, we're talking about discovering God's vision. Well, we know what vision is, that aspirational glimpse, that mental image. But but we're not saying, oh, be God my vision. No, I'm saying, God, I want your vision. Be thou, be you, God, my vision. Because God has a plan for our lives, but sometimes another thing that can trip us up is that we just get our own plans out there. We just try to try to have our own dreams and our own aspirations. But see, God has a plan for every one of our lives. He has a purpose for us. He has things he wants us to accomplish. The Bible says that he literally, before we were even created, he had good deeds prepared beforehand for us to do. God has a plan for our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11. Pastor Kevin used this verse last week. says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Somebody needs to hear that today. 
God has a plan for your life. It doesn't matter how much you feel like you've messed up, how far away from his plan he thinks that you think you are. God has a plan for your life right now, right where you are. Before the creation of the world, he knew that you would be right here, right in this moment today. And he has a plan, scripture says, to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan, a vision for our lives. So in this series, we're saying, God, be thou my vision. God, would you give me your vision for my life? Because God wants us to live our lives with vision. See, some of us, we go through life just feeling like, well, does God really have good things for me? Does God really have plans for me? Is that verse really true for me? Because sometimes the world can make us discouraged, and what it's trying to do is take away our faith. It's trying to take away that, that positive outlook that God is in control, and he is going to use every bad thing for his glory. He's going to use every difficult thing, every stressful thing, every trying season of our life to make us better. And my question for all of us today is, do we really believe that? When we're in a difficult situation in our lives, do we fall into the temptation of thinking, well, this must be outside of God's plan. God can't use this situation. Because what scripture says right here is that no matter what has happened in your life, he has plans to prosper you, not to harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. And this isn't a prosperity gospel. Okay, this isn't saying that from now on, if you have vision, you're going to experience no difficulties. No, Jesus literally says, in this world, you are going to have troubles. But what it is, what God promises is that through every difficult thing, he will use it for your good. And so I want us to figure out what does that look like? How do, how, if God really has this vision, he has this plan for our lives, how do we hear it? So if God is a vision for us, how do we find out what it is? First thing, how do we discover God's vision for our life? First thing we need to do, if you're here today, if you want a glimpse of that vision, we need to seek him. We need to seek him because here's the deal. God is the only one who holds your vision. Nobody else can reveal to you your vision. No fortune teller can go and tell you. No palm reader can tell you your vision. It belongs to God. Jeremiah 29, right after verse 11, in verse 12, it says, if you, I have this plan for you to prosper you, it says, then you will call on me. God says, then you will come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. He says, you will seek me and find me, and when you do that, when you seek God, you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. The way we follow all the words of this law. See, God wants to instruct us. He wants to give us his word, the Bible, to direct our lives. He wants to speak to us every day. And he's the only one who knows our future because he's outside of time. He knows the plans he has for you. You know the incredible thing about God? is not only does he know the plan that you're going to take, he knows every divergent of plan you could ever take. Have you ever thought about that? That because he's all-knowing, he literally knows what your life would look like if every single decision in your life went a different direction. Isn't that incredible? Like he knows right now, if you chose to, to root against the Vikings this afternoon, he knows what your life would look like, and it would be in shambles, people. Okay? <laughs> I have faith, hope, a positive mental image for the Vikings this afternoon. But he wants, he wants all of us to know the plans he has for us. He holds the future. And here's the deal. He wants to give us a glimpse. Again, he's not going to give us every detail. The Bible says that he's a lamp unto our feet, meaning he will just give us a little glimpse, just the next step ahead. But he also will give us a direction. He wants to fill our lives with hope, with this positive outlook. So 
We need to seek him. We do that in two ways. First, by reading the Bible. If we want to know God's vision for our lives, we need to seek him by reading the Bible. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then listen to this. It says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's saying that if we want to know God's will, we need to have our minds transformed. And we do that through reading the Bible. Literally, when we read God's word, it's not just for information. It is for transformation. See, the Bible is, is this incredible thing. The Bible says that it's, it's, this, it's living and active. Meaning that when we're reading the Bible, it is God speaking to us anew in every moment. That's why you can read a verse at one point in your life and then come back years later and something completely different will be brought out of it. That's God speaking through his word through you. And what happens is that as we read the Bible, it begins to change the way we think. It transforms our mind so that we can understand God. Meaning as we read the Bible more, we understand God more. And what it's saying is that we will be able to discern God's will easier. The more we read the Bible, the easier it will become to know his plans for us, his will for our lives. Probably one of the biggest questions I get as a pastor is, Pastor, how do I know God's will? How do I know what to do in this situation? The biggest piece of advice I can give you is read God's word. Because what I promise you is that God will never instruct you to do something that contradicts what he's already instructed you to do in his word. See, so many times when people ask that question, what should I do in this situation? Should, should I move in with my boyfriend? No, you shouldn't. Because God has already given us instruction in that area of our lives. See, if we want to know God's will, we need to get into his word. That's why I don't want us just to read the Bible. So many of us, we started a Bible plan. I started my Bible in a year plan, January 1st. I don't want us to do that just so we can get information. I want us to be in God's word because it's living and active. And as we read it, it writes into us. It literally makes us more and more like God. Slowly but surely. And if we do that, if we allow God to transform our mind, he says right here, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. We need to seek him through Bible reading. Colossians 3, 9 and 10 just reinforces this. It says, you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Literally, the more we know about God, the more he will renew us and make us into his image. He literally makes us more like him the more we know about him. The second thing we can do as we seek him is by praying. But I'm just not just talking about, thank you God for this food and now I lay me down to sleep. Okay, not those kind of prayers. I'm talking about praying by listening. If we really want to know God's will for our life, we want to have this vision for our lives, we need to listen. John 10 one through five says this, very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. And you're saying, Pastor, what are you? Why are you having us read this? Jesus is talking about himself. He's saying that he is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And he comes in by the pen, meaning by, by the, the natural way. And he says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And listen to this. The sheep listen to his voice. As Christ followers, we are meant to hear Jesus' voice. We're meant to hear God speaking to us. Not an audible voice. Not, me if I'm speaking. Okay? It's not like that. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. And we can know his voice. It says... He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep 
follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger, in fact. They will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. It's saying that we are allowed to hear from God, every one of us. Jesus wants to give us instruction by speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we know God's voice? Because the only way to know God's voice is by getting familiar with it. And we do that by listening. We open our Bible because we know every word in there is written for us. So that can start tuning us into the frequency. And then little by little, we start to just, just hear a little more. We hear a little more clearly, but the only way to hear God's voice is to practice it. And then when you hear something, ask somebody else, somebody who's more mature in their faith, come up and say, hey, I, I feel like God is maybe directing me in this way, pastor, or, or mentor, or, or friend. What do you think about this? And through that process, through, through reading God's word and praying, we can hear God's voice. Church, I don't want to be the only one hearing God's voice over our lives. Every single one of us can hear from God and then we can speak from God to his people to lift each other up. So how do we discover God's vision for our life? We seek him through Bible reading and prayer. Number two, then we hear it. So we start seeking God and then we hear him. We get this idea this week. I'm going to call all of us to pray to God, asking him to help us write this one sentence vision statement for each of our lives. And as we do that, then we hear it. We hear God's voice. Deuteronomy 3, 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. This is a promise in scripture. If you this week pray to God and ask him, God, would you reveal your vision for my life? What I promise you is that he will answer you. I promise. If you seek him, you will find him. And so we need to seek him first, and then we hear it. Thirdly, we write it. Okay, this week as we're coming and we're spending the week in prayer, praying for this vision statement over our lives, once we hear something, write it down. Okay, you would not believe how many times I've had to learn this lesson. Okay, I'm in prayer or, or I'm, I'm living my life and I hear God speak to me something. I feel like he put something on my heart and I'm like, oh my goodness, that is so awesome. And then 10 minutes later, I go to talk to my wife and I say, honey, can you believe what God told me? Wait, what was it again? Um, hold on. I know it was something like, I know it had something to do. Okay. When you hear it, write it down, please. Okay. I have learned this lesson so many times. Now I literally, the notepad on my phone is just filled with things that God says to me because I have found if I do not write it down immediately, there is a... 101% chance that I'm going to forget it. Okay? Like, it just happens. Write it down. Habakkuk 2.2 even says, Then the Lord replied, This is talking to Habakkuk here, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. It's saying when you get a revelation from God, when you hear from God something, write it down. Make it plain. Just, just put it on something. Write it on your hand if you have to. Find something, write it down, people. Because here's the deal. Here's why I make so, so many jokes about it. It's because if you're like me, you're not going to this week. And then 10 minutes later, you're going to come back and be like, wait, how did, how did God say that? How did he word it? And honestly, I want you to know every word that God has for you. Because every word that God speaks to us is incredibly profound. How incredible that we get to hear directly from the creator of the universe. That he wants to speak to you personal things for your life. So, write it down. Fourth, we seek it, hear it, write it, and then pray it. When God gives you that glimpse, that vision, begin praying it over your life because again, Vision is what's not yet. It's what could be. In faith, when we apply this to God and Christianity, it's what will be. Because what God declares, what he speaks, what he promises, it will come to pass. We don't know when, but we know it will. 
And so we can begin declaring it over our lives even before it is. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, everybody look at your neighbor and say, anything. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what, he asked, what we asked of him. See, and this is such a profound verse. Because you would not believe how many people come up to me and they say, Pastor, God just hasn't been answering my prayers lately. I mean, I've prayed for months, dozens of times. I've prayed and asked God to help me win the lottery. <laughs> and see, what scripture says here is that when we ask anything according to his will, it doesn't say that if we ask God for anything according to our will, meaning that if we pray things that we want for our lives that God doesn't want for our lives, we won't trump him. Okay, if we're trying to arm wrestle God into doing what we want, he's going to win. But it says, and this is profound, people, if we begin to seek God through Bible reading and prayer, and then... We begin to hear God's voice. Then we write it down. If we begin to pray what God has already spoken, anything we ask will be done. How powerful is that? Is If you could start to know God's will for your life and begin speaking that into existence before it even is. How incredible if you could really hear from God and literally be praying God into action. Scripture says that if my people would be humble themselves, turn from their sin, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and I will hear their land. If we pray in accordance with God's will, he answers us. And so we need to seek him, hear it, write it, pray it. See, and, and honestly, this whole pray it, formation is is really how i've learned to cast vision some people have come up and asked me you know like like how do you cast vision because um one of the things that i felt like god put so strongly on my heart when i came here is he said nick don't you go to that church if you don't know where you're going and now he's, he wasn't saying okay no everything you're going to do every way you're going to do it no he said nick you go into that church and you lead it with vision you know where I'm taking it. You start to hear me and write down promises that I am going to make true even before they exist. Because that's what vision casting really is. The reason I included in that verse, that in Proverbs 29, to where there is no prophetic vision, is because literally when we hear things from God and we begin speaking them, we begin praying them over our lives, we are declaring realities before they are real. Do you know that? How powerful. If you could go over your family tree and, and your kids or your grandkids or, or your family members and you could begin declaring God's will over their life, knowing that it's going to happen. What if we really started hearing from God and we started declaring realities before they were even real? Before we even stepped place in this church, God gave me the vision that we were going to be a church that was the perfect place for imperfect people. Meaning that we were going to be a place that never tried to act perfect. And before I even walked in this building, I began prophesying that over this place, that legalism and judgmentalism would have to bow to the name of Jesus that calls everybody into his house. Before we even got here, God gave me the vision that we were going to be a church that above all else, that about that rather than being selfish and walking into this place and all of us asking the question, what can I get today? God spoke to me and said, Nick, you are going to be a church that is focused on reaching the lost. I did not come to heal the healthy. I came to heal the sick. And that's why we declared the vision of reach church is to reach the lost. And before we even were here, I began speaking that into existence. Because I believe that that's what God wants us to be. A church not 
thinking about, oh, what can I get? What can I consume? It's what can I give? What can I contribute? How could I be a part of somebody else coming to know the hope that I have in Jesus? That's why our vision as a church, reach church, is to reach the lost. That's what God spoke to me as I leave this church with vision. And we've seen it accomplished. In a little over a year, we've doubled in attendance. And we don't celebrate attendance numbers because they're big or they're cool. We celebrate growing by one as long as that one is celebrating one person. As long as one person is coming to faith. As long as one person is being empowered and encouraged, we'll celebrate one every time. Amen? Amen. And so over your life, what things do you need to start praying for you? As we look into God's word, as we start evaluating what his will for our lives is, what do you need to start speaking over your life? I promise you, looking into scripture and reading through it, one of the most powerful things you can do is praying scripture over your life. You can start this week. If you haven't yet, write down Jeremiah 29, 11. What would happen if you started praying over your life? God, I know that you have plans to, plans to prosper me, not to harm me. Plans to give me hope and a future. So God, right now, I believe that. And I pray that you would make that a reality in my future. What if you woke up every morning this next year and began praying that over your life? See, because church, I want every one of you to experience every little thing that God has for you. I believe that God has incredible plans for every single one of you. Why? Because he promises it right here to us in scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11 plans to prosper you. He doesn't want to harm you. Harm will come, but then he will use that harm to help you grow stronger. He has a plan and a future for you. And he wants us to know what it is. So how do we discover God's vision for me? We seek him. We hear it. We write it. We pray it. And lastly, we start it. We start it. John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. And they don't stop there. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow. What does following look, following Jesus look like? A step. And then it says, I lead my sheep. They listen. They hear my voice. I tell them what to do. The another step. Following looks like this. Faith in Jesus is really just taking the next step after the next step after the next step after the next step. And you know what's amazing? If we do that, we will find ourselves right in the midst of the vision that he led us with all along. Church, I cannot tell you how incredible it feels to be a year in here. And I promise you, we're not at where God's vision for our church is yet. But I promise you, we are on the way. We are steps closer to what God has for us. And what I pray for you is at the end of 2020, you look back over this year and you look at your life and you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am not where I was. I am steps closer to that vision that God has for me. But we need to start it because it starts with a step. So right now, would you bow your head? And I believe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking. He speaks to us anytime, anywhere, as long as we're listening. Right now, is he putting something in your heart? A vision for you. If so, just write it down.
Maybe you just are going to start praying today, saying, God, what do you want from me? God, what's your vision? What, what could this one sentence vision statement be for my life? And when you hear something, write it down. Don't delay. Write it down. Because I believe that God has a plan for every one of you, hope in a future. He wants us to live our lives with vision so we don't decline. We don't decay. We experience growth. We experience development. We strengthen over time. So what is God speaking to you? Let's just take 20 seconds and would you just say, God, what are you speaking to me for me? Thank you for having a personal relationship with every one of us. God, I thank you that you speak to every one of us personally. God, that we can hear from you as long as we're in Christ Jesus. Your Holy Spirit draws us to him even before we're a Christian. God, you speak to our hearts. And you want to be speaking to us all the time. God, I pray that we would just start this practice of listening. Help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. I want to let you know that uh, that prayer you just prayed is the first, maybe, of the year. But I hope it's not the last. Because every January, we do something that I just love. This is actually the first, but it will be every. Uh, it's 21 days of prayer and fasting every January, every start to the year. And so we're going to begin either today or tomorrow, depending on whether you're a morning devotion person or a nightly devotion person. Uh, you can start either today or tomorrow, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so uh, I've selected uh, a little devotional for us to do together. If you guys have the Bible app, you can take out your phone right now. If you go on the Bible app, the one we're doing is called Awakening, 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. So right now you can go in the Bible app, look at plans, just type in Awakening 21 Days, and it should be right there. It should look just like that. And it's just a guide if you do that. Otherwise, at the welcome desk, I have 20 copies printed of the whole 21-day devotional. So if you're a paper person, that is just fine. We have copies printed for you back there. For the next 21 days, I want our church to set aside time that we would seek God, asking him for his vision for our lives. There's devotionals for every day, just a couple paragraphs and usually one verse to start off. And over this next week, we're going to ask God that question. God, would you help me write my vision statement? Really, God, would you help me write your vision statement for me? And we're going to take the next seven days and seek God to discover his vision for me. And you'll discover his vision for you. And then next week, we'll move into what's mine and what's ours. But this week, we're going to follow the devotional and pray God's will into our lives. And we do it by seeking him, reading the Bible, praying, hear it, write it, pray it, and then start it. Whatever he speaks, we take a step towards. And I believe that if we do this, by the end of 2020, we're going to find ourselves so much closer, not just to where God wants us to be, not just to who he wants us to be. We're going to be closer to God and closer to everything he has for us. So can I pray that over you? Everybody, would you stand to your feet? Father, I pray over your people. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them this week. God, I pray that you would help us to hear your voice. God, I pray that you would guide us, you would direct us. God, that you would be our vision. God, I pray that we would trade our dreams for your dreams. God, our vision for your vision. Would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, help us discern what you're saying apart from what the world is saying. Lord, transform our minds as we don't just read your word. God, as you write it onto our hearts. God, I pray that you would help us to hear from you. 
God, then we would write it down and begin speaking your vision, your future, your plans into our lives. God, reveal yourself to us, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you're here today and you would like prayer for something going on in your life, prayer team is coming forward right now. Them and their spouses, we would love the opportunity to pray for you. Otherwise, everybody, God bless you. Grab some coffee and donuts, and we'll see you next week for week two of our series, Be Thou My Vision. God bless you. If you'd like prayer, come on down to the front.